Mount Van Roosburg, who, as we would know by now, is uh, the considered uh, foremost expert and foremost representative of Middle Dutch mysticism. Okay, yes, indeed. Good afternoon, brothers. Um, indeed, l l we will now start focus more on um, Jan van Ruisboek, John of Ruisboek. And uh, before we start with the text, maybe I should tell a bit about his life, situate him somewhat in, uh, in time and space, and then we will read several of his texts because he will be our main guide today and tomorrow. Since indeed he is the, the most important representative of the Middle Dutch mystical tradition. He was born in the year 1293 in, well, Ruisbroek, because that's not a family name, it is a name that refers to the place where he is born. And uh, at first sight, things would be very clear then, but there is a, there is an, a certain ambiguity. It's not certain which Ruisbroek is actually meant, because there are a few possibilities. Uh, there is a village in the south of Brussels, which is called Ruisbroek, but there is also a district, or there was a district in the city of Brussels itself, which was called Ruisbroek. And uh, according to the biography written after Ruisbroek's death, he would be born in that village. There are, all, however, some indications that he might be born in the city of Brussels itself. For those of you who have, an, uh, who have been in Brussels, uh, that area, which was called Brussels, is now more is where now more or less is the central station of Brussels. This the, the whole medieval part of Brussels was completely destroyed when the uh, the central station was built and the connection between the north and the south station um, train connection. They simply destroyed the whole medieval uh, part. Uh, but there there has been a, 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 a medieval uh, center there, and we know that. In any case, Jan van Ruisbroek was educated by his uncle, who was a priest uh, in, um, uh, working for the uh, Church of St. Godola, which is now the Cathedral of Brussels, and that the house of that priest, Jan Hinkaert, was located right in front of the main entrance of the church the best place for a priest serving in a church, namely to live there. It was the collegial church, so the <coughs> church of, uh, of canons. Uh, there, were, there were two chapters, the, the major chapter and the minor oh. chapter. The major chapter was um, founded uh, by uh, the Duke of Brabant a uh, few centuries before and was kind of honorary title to be a canon of the major chapter of the, of the, Saint, the Church of St. Gudula was a kind of honorary title. The actual liturgical service uh, was done by the, chap the canons of the minor chapter and um, the um, uncle of uh, uh, Jan, Jan van Ruisbroek, John of Ruisbroek, was one of them. He was responsible for the education of the boy. We don't actually we don't know much about the parents of uh, Jan Ruisbroek. He, um, his father is not mentioned in the biography. Question mark. We don't know anything about him. His mother is mentioned, namely that on in the end of her to when she uh, grew older that she uh, moved in in the beginage of uh, Brussels, uh, so that she lived the life of a begin. So. Yeah, he was educated by his uncle, and at the age of 24, he was ordained a priest, and then was a diocesan priest in the city of Brussels for about 25 years. And it is in that, in that context that he started to write his works. So um, this major mystical author was a person who was actively working 
in the in his uh, in the apostolate which was expected uh, from him as a, a priest in the city of Brussels. So, so he he was not uh, far from the the crowd of people. On the contrary, he was among the people and in in the, in the heart of the church. We don't know anything about the intellectual formation which he uh, has had. It is obvious when you read his text that he must have had a very good intellectual education, but the biography completely omits that. We have no idea where he studied. In case he would have studied at the University of Paris, which at that time was the main university in, in Europe, well, apart from those in England, of course, uh, but on the, co on the continent. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> put things straight. <laughs> uh, of course, universities were a relatively young phenomenon at that moment. Eh? So there was, uh, there was Oxford and Cambridge, there was Paris, there was Bologna, and uh, what is it, Montpellier, uh, but there, are, there were not that many universities at that time. Eh? But Paris was certainly on the continent the, the, the most important uh, university. If he would have studied there, Ruysbroek certainly would have become afterwards a canon. And he was never a canon in his life. So he had the lowest uh, rank on the, in the hierarchy of priests in the church of St. Godola, uh, namely that of a chaplain, which means that he had a chapel to say mass for the group that paid him, uh, that paid that chapel, and the, and the chaplain connected to that chapel. It seems that um, at a certain moment there must have been, and we don't know exactly what it was, there must have been difficulties with the clergy in Brussels. And uh, Jan van Ruysbroek, John Ruysbroek, his uncle and uh, some friends left the city and went into the wood to live as hermits. I will come back later on uh, uh, with regard to the, what, what, what this conflict may have been. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, but let me say for the, for the time being, they left the safe security of the city because the city is, of course, a medieval city, is a safe place to live. That's well organized, there's, there's, there's protected by the city walls, and, and the, the so social structure is very well uh, organized. Those who desire to live elsewhere, especially in, 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 in the forests, uh, are in a very vulnerable position. And apparently that is what uh, they chose to do they um, were given the permission to live in an, in an hermitage which was empty at that moment and which belonged to the Duke. One of these friends was in close connection with the Duke and the Duke gave them the permission to uh, use that house and uh, on one condition, namely that they would build a little church and uh, uh, celebrate um, daily mass there. That is what they did and that is what happened in the year 1343. Easter week, during Easter week, they moved from Brussels, left the city and moved into the wood. We can still visit the place, by the way, that's where they lived. Um, after a number of years, after seven years, it seemed, or again the biography is somewhat vague about that, but it seemed to be better to ask for a um, canonical uh, a status that was um, uh, acknowledged by the church. And so they uh, took the rule of St. Augustine and became an Augustinian priory, uh, of which um, Jan van Ruysbroek was the prior. Well, actually, the, the Jan Hinkart, his uncle, was the provost, uh, was uh, the, the highest in rank. And uh, Jan van Ruysbroek, John of Ruysbroek, became the prior. 
uh, function which he had until his death in 1381. You see, he, he became an old man. Eh? So, yeah. of, of people say that people uh, did not become old in the Middle Ages. Well, some people, some people did become old, eh? but not many. Eh? There were m more people who died younger than, than now, of course. Well, given the progress that medical science has, has made, meanwhile. Uh, Jan van Ruysbroek wrote his works. He, well, first of all, he wrote, eh? and he wrote his works, and at the end of his life, uh, he has written, uh, he, he, he had written a number of treatises, which now in the um, modern uh, critical edition is a set of ten volumes, so it's a rather extensive uh, work which he has written, and it's all in Dutch. This is vernacular mystical literature. He is not the first one to write in, in, in Dutch uh, mystical literature. I, as I mentioned, that was Hadwig and Beatrice of Nazareth, but uh, Ruysbroek also wrote in Dutch. He could have written in Latin, of course, which was the lingua franca, the, 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 the language which was used uh, in, in all of Europe. Why didn't he write in uh, Latin? I think there is a, a whole discussion about that. I think that the reason is that he did not want to publish. If you want to publish in the medieval period, you write in Latin and then everyone could understand you from Poland to Portugal. But if you write in Dutch, then it is for a very limited circle of people. And I think that this is the reason, that, or the, the most obvious reason, that he was simply writing for a very limited number of people. We know that uh, one of his works was written for one single hermit. We know that one of his works was written for one single poor Claire. Of course, he realized that once a text was written that it could be copied and distributed and, and that it could, it could find its, its way. But I think that he had in his mind that the, the people who would read his works that this, the number would be very, very limited. In other words, he did not want his message to be heard in, in the whole of Europe. Eh? That was really not his... He is, he is a very, in that regard, a very, uh, very modest person. Why did he write? The biography mentions that in those days that there was a great need for spiritual guidance and help because not because there was no spiritual life there was spiritual life but that this spiritual life went in the wrong direction uh, it, it is uh, related to a uh, phenomenon which we call the it's, it's called the movement of the free spirit the movement of the free spirit, we, ha we don't have much documentation about that. One of our main sources is John of Ruysbroek's works. Um, the free spirit is a movement, not very well organized, but it's kind of a broad movement of spiritual life in which the um, basic idea was that the, um, the goal of, the, uh, of spiritual life is to become a, a mystic, a contemplative. And once the person would have reached that stage, then he didn't need the um, sacraments anymore. He didn't need to take care about the, uh, the works of charity anymore. That was all for the, for the beginners. Um, didn't need to follow the commandments anymore uh, because once when is when is has become a mystic a contemplative then is one then one is united to the spirit of God and the spirit of God is free uh, you don't need all these things are like only st step stones on the way to that uh, goal. John of Ruysbroek very strongly objects to that, showing that this is a misunderstanding of spiritual life and that active life and contemplative life 
are not in opposition with one another, as if the active is the, well, that's, that's the beginning, and then the higher form is the contemplation. Not at all. That these are simply different aspects of one and the same reality, which is called minna, love. There are different aspects of love and uh, different levels of, of, of awareness in, in love, but it is a complex reality which implies both activity, activity of the human person, and deep, being deeply rooted in, passively being rooted in the love that is God, that the transcendent love that is God. So I think that is one of the, 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 the probably the biography is, is correct here, and to, to point out that this is the main motive of Ruzbuk to write, namely to clarify and explain this. Before uh, Ruzbuk, people have written about that, but apparently not clearly enough, and, and the, the works were um, yeah, misunderstood. I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So I think we could say that John of Ruysbroek is a person who writes out of a, a kind of uh, uh, concern to give spiritual direction to people who are living various forms of spiritual life in order to help them and to show that what is the most profound and deep Christian way of living a spiritual life. It is very striking, I find, that in almost none of his works, with the exception of the, the work which was uh, written for this poor Claire, this nun, well, that's, that's, I think that's the only uh, exception, that in none of his works he limits spiritual life to religious people. Or, or priests, or members of the clergy. And in many cases, there are, so to speak, occasions which he could have taken to limit his view to people belonging to the, the clergy, for example. But he never does that. So his spirituality, his way of describing spiritual life, has nothing to do with the specific place that a person has in the church, it is true for every Christian in the church. And he is, he is quite consistent in that. His works uh, are, uh, some works are rather extensive works, uh, like for example his uh, Spiritual Tabernacle is, a, is really a big volume and is a very, very elaborate uh, commentary, spiritual commentary on the uh, the, um, uh, the tabernacle, uh, this, as a, the, the sanctuary, uh, the hum this building of the tabernacle in the Old Testament as a metaphor for that what is the, the inner life of the human person and the encounter with God. Also his spiritual espousals, which, is, which we would consider now as his masterpiece. Um, it's, it's really the, the whole panorama of uh, spiritual life is described uh, in, 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 in a very clear and, and beautiful uh, language. Uh, some of his texts are shorter. Uh, um, we will uh, see some uh, short quotations from uh, a shorter work which is called The Sparkling Stone, uh, one of his earlier works which was written for one hermit uh, after a conversation which Ruizbuk has ha had had with uh, this hermit, and at the end of the conversation, this man said, well, this was now really very helpful. Now things are becoming clear for me. Eh? Could, why don't you write this down? Eh? I, I could read it afterwards, and I think I know someone else who could profit from it. Eh? And, well, Ruizbuk wrote it down. I find it, personally, a fantastic work. It's really very, very beautiful. Uh, uh, I have made a whole translation of it, and I've been teaching that text for years, and the more I read it, the better it becomes. It's really a, 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 it's a, it's a, a jewel, a gem. Um, after his death, the chancellor of the University of Paris received 
somewhat later, uh, um, an, a Carthusian send a copy of the work of uh, Reusbroek, the spiritual espousals, to the Chancellor of the University of Paris, uh, Gerson, and um, this Carthusian probably thought that uh, the Chancellor, who was a personal friend of that uh, Carthusian, would be very happy with such a fantastic book, uh, and the um, Chancellor read the book and read it twice and said, I, uh, I think you would better throw away the last part of it because that is very, very, comes very close to a heretical doctrines. Unfortunately, because that what Gerson, the reproaches and the objections which he had uh, to that book are really unjustified. It is clear that he, of course, he could not read Dutch. He read the text in translation. Uh, but still, I think he has not correctly understood what Ruzburg said. This is the reason, I, this is one of the reasons I think that Ruzburg, even though he, he was read throughout the ages in, in, uh, uh, in, in the, by people who were interested in spiritual literature, that it took a long time before he was actually beatified and, and, and officially uh, recognized as an uh, uh, that this doctrine is, was correct, recognized by the church. It's only in uh, 1909 that he was uh, and, um, blessed by, um, by the church. He has never been canonized, so still possible. But I was just thinking, <laughs> there is maybe someone here <laughs> who could take <laughs> the cause of his look. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tomorrow I will say a bit more about um, a few uh, specific details in, uh, in the life of Ruizbroek uh, and discussions which he has had and, and also this, uh, why this is precisely a crucial moment and also some, something about the uh, um, influence later on. I think it's now time that we take a look at um, one or two texts. And um, I would like to start with this uh, text which, which I've given this, uh, the title, The Human Person in Relationship with God. It's a, a, a short quotation from that masterpiece, The Spiritual Espousals. And uh, I have uh, chosen this because it uh, somewhat kind of summarizes this scheme which I have uh, explained this morning. I will first read it and then give a few words of comment afterwards. We find a triple unity in all people naturally and in good people also supernaturally. The first and the highest unity is in God, for all creatures hang in this unity with their being life and subsistence. And if they should be cut off in this way from God, they would fall into nothingness and be annihilated. This unity is in us essentially by nature, whether we are good or evil, and it renders us neither holy nor blessed without our effort. We possess this unity in ourselves and, in fact, above ourselves as a principle and support of our being and our life. A second union or unity is also in us by nature, that is, the unity of the higher faculties, where they take their natural origin as to their activity namely in the unity of the spirit or of the mind. This is the same unity which is hanging in God, but in the latter instance we understand it as active and in the former as essential. Nevertheless, the spirit is totally within each unity, according to in the entirety of its substance. 
we possess this unity in ourselves above sensory perception and from it come memory and intellect and will and every faculty of spiritual activity. In this unity we call the soul spirit. The third unity which is in us by nature is the domain of the bodily faculties in the unity of the heart, the beginning and origin of bodily life. The soul possesses this unity in the body and in the natural vigor of the heart and from it flow all bodily activity and the five senses. Here the soul is therefore called soul since it is the form of the body and it animates the body. That is, it makes it a living thing and keeps it living. These three unions exist in us naturally as one life and one kingdom. On the lowest level we are sensitive and animal, on the middle level we are rational and spiritual, on the highest level we are upheld essentially and this is natural in all mankind. So you see this is more or less what I uh, explained, but of course he is saying it in a much better way than what I did. So. And the, uh, I find that this, um, the, 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 one of the interesting things is that he is referring, that he explained, is explaining that uh, and saying that he is true for, for everyone. Uh, uh, whether we are uh, good or evil, that doesn't make, that doesn't make a difference. Eh? So we, that is the structure of the human person. And he starts by explaining this structure in its contact with God. We are hanging in God. And it's a typical word for, for Ruiz, okay? Uh, we are hanging in God. Eh? In, in, in another work, he uses the um, image of an upside-down tree. We have our roots in God, eh? and the, the 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 rest of the tree is uh, is is, is uh, have, has its life because it's rooted in God. First and highest unity is in God. The creatures hang in this unity with their being, life, and subsistence. And this contact can never be interrupted. Hmm? I said yesterday. For Ruizwuk, the two fingers of the creating God and and and, uh, and Adam, eh, you, you you can't disconnect that eh, because then the creature simply stops; it is it it does not exist anymore. And so this contact is always there, whether we feel it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we are awake or asleep. This contact is always there. Whether we are good or evil, eh? it's also the case for the, the worst sinner eh? that, that he hangs in God. Eh? And as Ruizbuk says, as we possess this in ourselves and above ourselves. Eh? There is actually m more in us than, than, we, uh, than we might realize, eh? more than our existence and our being, since it is rooted in, in God. Eh? And on this level, the human person does nothing. We, we, we simply receive that. Eh? And yet it is the source of our activity, of our autonomous being. It is the source of our thinking, wanting, desiring, choice, making choices, etc. Eh? Remembering the source of all our activity. So it's, and, and I think this is really something which Ruizbuk has seen very clearly and which is a very helpful uh, point. Eh? The human person is an autonomous being. We, we autonomously make our choices in life. Uh, we are not just puppets in the hands of God. Eh? We are uh, autonomous beings. And yet we cannot without God because he is the source of our existence. And apparently that is how he creates us, continuously, every second again.
And that's how he says that. Uh, that's why, why he says in the second union or unity is also in us by nature, the unity of the higher faculties, where they take their natural origin as to their activity in the unity of the spirit and of the mind. It is the same unity which is hanging in God, but in the latter instance, we understand it as active and in the former as essential. See, here we have the problem with the English translation or the French or the Italian or the Latin. Eh? Essential, but actually it re refers to being. Eh? The fact that we are. That comes from God. So there is, uh, there, there, the, on the, in the deepest level, we are pure receptivity. Eh? receive our being from God and precisely that is then the source of our activities. I think for the correct understanding of how contemplation and action belong together, this is a crucial insight which Rizbu gives us here. And that the one does not exclude the other, the one is not in opposition with the other, not at all, because it's, it's basically the same reality but seen from a different point of view. And he says, we possess this unity in ourselves above sensory perception. Yeah, above, um, I think we in our, in the language of the 21st century, we would always refer to these things as deeper. Eh? Me medieval persons refer to higher, and we would say that is deeper than our sensory perception. It is a metaphor, of course, and, and that there, with it, there is no... It's not about meters or kilometers higher or deeper, and it's, it's, it's just a metaphor, but it is of another, a more, another level than the sensory perception. And from it come memory, intellect and will, and every faculty of spiritual activity. In this unity we call the soul spirit. You see, he is a bit mixing up the terms. In fact, he tries to make some distinction with this, these terms of soul, spirit, mind, Teresa of Avila says, I don't know the difference. I, th I think it's all the same. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> indeed, these, these, these terms are not so very clear cut. And uh, yeah, what, what is the soul? I think it can be taken in a, in a more general sense of these yeah, aspects of uh, the, 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 the meaningful aspect of sensory perception, memory, intellect, will, um, images, mental images, fantasy, uh, feelings, that that belongs to the level of what we call soul. And usually they would uh, reserve the word spirit for that contact with, the, with God, with the Holy Spirit. The third unity, which is in us by nature, is the domain of the bodily faculties in the unity of the heart. Eh? So, uh, whereas um, in, in biblical term, terminology, the heart would be the core of the human person. Uh, that core is called by Ruisbroek Wezen. Eh? And when he is referring to the heart, he, I think he refers more to the level of feelings. Eh? bodily activity and the five senses and here is the fo the soul is here called soul since it is the form of the body namely that's a reference to the uh, the latin saying anima animat eh? the soul animates eh? yeah. makes it a living thing keeps it keeps it alive and that exists in us naturally as one life and one kingdom i think also this is an important aspect and so even though he distinguishes these different aspects they are fundamentally one it is one person it is one life there's something going wrong with the translation devices i think And when he says on the lowest, le lowest, but don't understand that in a pejorative sense, eh? the lowest level, this is the most obvious level. Eh? 
uh, or, or the most outward level, we are sensitive and animal in the sense of these are things that we share with the animals, uh, because also the animals have five senses. On the middle level, we are rational and spiritual. On the highest level, we are upheld, essentially, and this is natural in all mankind. In the spiritual espousals, the book, The Spiritual Espousals, he will then describe spiritual life on the three levels, namely the level of the activities, intellectual, voluntary, um, mental activities, uh, on the level of being drawn inwards in a more passive sense towards that com point of contact, that the experience of, of the, the, the presence of God, and then also the experience which he says occurs very rarely, only a very few people have that experience, namely to be really rooted in God eh, and to have this experience of living in God. Let me take uh, one more uh, text before the coffee break, um, a shorter text which is then taken from the sparkling stone. This is in uh, that short work which I uh, appreciate more and more, where he describes this um, ex contemplative experience of the deepest level, in my scheme the highest level, eh, but it is the deepest, in, we, we could say the deepest levels as well. And the context is a, a kind of comment on the um, experience of the disciples who were, who could, uh, were allowed to, to, to join with Jesus on the, on the mountain, on Mount, mountain Tabor. Uh, f uh, at the, and, and, and saw the transfiguration of Jesus. When we have ascended with Jesus, the mountain where our images sees, in other words, the level which is, in his terminology, higher, or in our terminology, l deeper than our concepts, our images, what we think about God, deeper than that, or higher than that, if we follow him then with one-fold vision, there are not many ideas there then, but there is just this one pure, simple vision, with intimate pleasure and with joyful inclination, we feel the strong heat of the Holy Spirit that makes us burn and melt in God's unity. For where one with God's Son, we are brought lovingly back to our beginning, and that is what Christ does by assuming our humanity, namely bring us as human persons, bring us back to our beginning, the source, there where we come from. There we hear the voice of the Father that touches us, drawing us in, for he speaks to all he has chosen in his eternal word, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I think it's quite remarkable what he says here, namely, it's not this, the voice of the Father is saying that in the Gospel about Jesus Christ, and Ruzwuk in a certain sense, applies this to, well, each of us. We hear the same voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I love you in the same way as I love my Son. For you must know that the Father with the Son and the Son with the Father have taken eternal pleasure in that the Son should assume our humanity and die and bring all the chosen back to their beginning. And therefore, 
when we are elevated into our origin by the Son, we hear the voice of the Father that draws us in and enlightens us, enlightens us with the truth eternal. And this truth eternal is the love of the Father for each one of us. Fundamentally the same as the love which he, with which he loves his, uh, his only begotten Son. What Ruizbuk says here is, an, is a very, I would say, very strong <coughs> statement, but in a way it is the same as what we have seen in the text of William of Saint-Thierry, that in the deepest reality of the human person, and so the, uh, the, 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 the way the, the human person is loved by God, it is the same as how the Father and the Son love each other in the Holy Spirit. We share the same spirit. It is really the human person shares in the full life of, uh, of the Trinity. And that is why, well, so the connection with the Son is, of course, here. And so that we will see later on, but that will be for tomorrow, when we read the, another text that he speaks about the birth of Christ in the soul, uh, that is precisely that, that we are united with Christ and share the same love relationship with the Father. And that is this uh, one-fold vision, this simple, pure vision of this, this, the truth eternal, and uh, this simple truth eternal, which is basically this um, uh, transcendent love in which we are rooted. I think it's... Um, Time to stop now for the coffee break. The and, uh, yeah. I'm not sure they'll be ready until 4.30 for the coffee break. Okay. So we will be just checking if coffee is ready so that uh -huh. we will... <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. okay, good, yes. <laughs> I'd like to avoid another one of the... Um, <laughs> Good, good, yes. Ah, 4.30, because at 5.10 is the common sharing, so that would be very, uh, very, very short then, yes. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, good. Coffee break. Okay, so it uh, seems that we have coffee available this time. Let's hope.